and that is longer than anybody you're having. And I'm saying this to say there is so much more to come here in Slumberton. So do stay with us until noon. Now, joining us today on Zoom is Ms. Erin Gurish, a qualified clinical psychotherapist, a counselor, and the founder of Ahia Healing, an alternative healing modality focusing on physical and emotional her is known for the ability to readily identify with clients underlying emotional root problems and proceed to effectively combine various healing techniques and therapies to promote deep healing and emotional releases and today we'll be talking about an extremely important topic managing anxiety and some of the solutions from an islamic perspective salam alaikum zahir Alaikum How are you, Sister Alhamdulillah, we're good. And we were just saying, isn't it? We uh, did a topic a few weeks ago, um, and it'd be good to kind of have a little series on uh, on this and in relation to holistic healing and a lot of the important things that you address. And starting today with anxiety, or rather carrying on from what we were last discussing. Mm. So, so here, talk us through this. You know, what is anxiety for our viewers and how would someone know if they're experiencing anxiety? Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. As-salatu wassalamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. So anxiety is something that has become a very common phrase within our household, uh, Alhamdulillah, over the last few years. It, in the sense, Alhamdulillah, that there is an awareness about it. The awareness is such that, you know, people feel that um, you know, they get short of breath or they feel panicky or what is known as a panic attack. But what is anxiety? Anxiety literally is the fear of the unknown, the fear of the future, or the fear of um, not being able to control how the future will unfold in front of you. And so what tends to happen, subhanAllah, is as we grow up, we have, you know, um, we have this uh, experience of, good and bad, but there's usually a lot of traumas that we sort of have to encounter as we're going through. And what our ego does, what our nafs does, the, the part of us that is really connected to fight, flight, or freeze, um, is maintain the, the whole sense that we need to survive, you know, that there's a threat out there and that we need to really overcome it, um, and whatever it takes. And so we are constantly um, in a vigilant state of being. And whenever this happens, that starts to really affect our whole physiology, right down from the way we start to breathe. So you notice someone that is anxious, they usually have very shallow breaths. And this is something that you know you can look out for is, at what points in the day, at what times in the day, do you feel that anxiety coming up? It's simply by the way that your breathing changes. So normally, um, you know, a gentle uh, deep breath would be a deep in and a deep out. If you're breathing at that calm state, then your body really is in a relaxed state. But if you are shallow, <coughs> you know, breathing quite shallow, <laughs> then you know that you're moving into panic, you're moving into anxiety. And so, again, the the, the real uh, clue over here is the way that you breathe. If your body starts to feel hot, um, you start to sweat, you start to feel, you know, like uh, you can't breathe or your collar's too tight. All of these are signs that, you know what, anxiety is starting to build up. So again, one is to look out for triggers. Okay, where is it that this actually happens to you? Um, in whose presence does it happen? In which environment does it happen? And for people who have had anxiety for a long time, the onset of the panic attack happens randomly. So there aren't any triggers involved anyway. So at that sort of later stage is where you really need to start seeking professional help. And I've never heard of the stress responses like uh, uh, fight, flight, freeze, fawn. Uh, being linked to the nuts, the ego, like that, that that's a complete new kind of phenomenon. Is, is that okay. what you kind of uh, push out there with your own work? No, absolutely, because we need to understand there are seven levels of the nuts. Okay, seven. So we all begin at nuts al -Amara, and then at that stage, everything is about survival. And everything is about what I want. It doesn't consider anything else at that point. All it's thinking about is how can I acquire, how can I fulfill my desires, and how will I procreate? That's all it is. Once you start to grow out of that phase, or some people fail to do so in their whole lives, the next stage up is nafs al-lawama. There you have a consciousness, and you think, okay, 
if I carry out certain selfish acts for myself, there is consequence of others. And so as we continue to grow, <coughs> that leads us next into nafs mulhima, where we become the inspired nafs. And within that, subhanAllah, we have this internal connection, a dialogue or you know, um, guidance through dreams or whatever it may be, until we reach ultimately what Allah has asked us, nafs mutmainna. So Allah says, Ya ayyatuhu nafs mutmainna, irji'i ila rabbik, now come back to me. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us down, and then he says, asfala he dropped us to the lowest of the low. And our journey literally is And so we have these four categories to climb up. And ultimately that is your Amara, Nawama, Mulhima, and Mutmainna. And then as we get to that stage of uh, Mutmainna, then Allah says, Radiya Then the fifth and the sixth stages are in the hypocrisy. And then there is a special category of the nafs, which is uh, known as nafs al-kamila. This is reserved for the prophets and for the masoom, for the children that have passed away before the last. So, alhamdulillah, there's, there's a whole journey that we need to undertake. And this is where you find that anxiety also plays in the lower levels um, of our nafs as well. So between uh, Amara and Lawama and in Mulhima also. But then as you transcend and get to Mutma'inna, then you, you start to really um, sort of understand the bigger picture. Allah is ultimately in control. You really sort of embody this, this the phrase, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah within yourself. And that's where it eases off, the seas calm down. Um, I think it's incredible just listening to you there, how much there is um, built in in terms of knowledge and understanding, uh, generally in terms of anxiety itself, and then from an Islamic perspective as well. And I know uh, in this short interview, you can only scratch the surface, but it's so helpful to hear and understand that. Um, we do have a lot of viewers who likely don't recognize anxiety in themselves. You know, um, it's, it's, it's kind of a known reference or word, but actually what it feels like and when sometimes they have it and they go through it and they don't actually recognize it. So you mentioned uh, shortness of breath. Um, are there are there anything more specific in terms of what happens? And I know you touched on some of this. What happens in your actual body when you're experiencing anxiety? Is there is there anything just so it can resonate, maybe for some of our viewers that have been through it and don't even realize? Okay, yeah. So shortness of breath is one. A panic is the other. Um, you feel suffocated. You feel you can't breathe. So all of these things are similar. But then ultimately, and, and this is amazing, right? Because from sort of a psychosomatic point of view, what's actually happening is there's a threat to your life. And when you feel that you're under attack and that you have to run away, mm. you know, the, the flow of air and oxygen has to really increase within yourself. Um, and then what's also happening is there is this fear that I will be drowned or I will be suffocated. And this is why taking short breaths, it, it's automatically coming from the amygdala, it's coming from your survival response, and it, 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 the other thing also that happens at that point is all the energy resources are sent to the extremities, i.e. your limbs. Okay, so either you're going to fight, so you need the energy in your hands, or into your legs, so you need to run. Or in this case, there wouldn't be such a freeze unless you feel that there's something falling upon you, where you sort of just go, <gasps> freeze, and what's going to happen next? And so with that, as you move through those different, different symptoms, how does anxiety affect the body now? Prolonged, uh, you know, states of anxiety ultimately lead to stress. Okay, and then once stress sort of, you know, roots into our bodies, then that is where we really begin to start understanding what the impact is. So anything from headaches, okay, so stress will start to affect headaches. Um, it'll give you stiffness in your in your muscles, especially the neck and the shoulders. And like we said last time, I believe, um, you know, the stiffness in the shoulders. It's all around carrying responsibility. If the stress is down your back and there's back aches, um, it just depends on what part of the back is affected by this anxiety or the stress. Um, it could be financial, it could be family, it could feel that there's lack of support in your in your in your environment. All of that ultimately will still impact you in that in that particular way. Um, stress will impact your digestion. Okay, mm -hmm. so especially people with IBS, um, it's always to do with what your body cannot digest going on around the environment. And when you see that, when you see injustices happening, especially within the household, <clears throat> and we see that with a lot of young 
uh, women generally that, that come into a marriage, for example, or even in, in early teens where they're really having those internal battles of identifying who they are, um, IBS manifests itself quite, quite rapidly there. We get thyroid issues as well connected to stress, uh, infertility, endometriosis, PCOS, fibroids, the whole list, anything that's in the body that can go wrong, we can lead it back to stress, and stress comes from anxiety in little doses. And I guess the one adjoining word for all of them is inflammation, and that is this chronic uh, stress yeah. that has manifested. So what is inflammation? Inflammation is inflamed emotions, Inf emotions that haven't been dealt with. All, so, all these words, all these uh, conditions <laughs> actually uh, link back to the feeling. You know, there's always a root uh, connection. There has to be a root. Them. There has to be a root. So... Every symptom on our body is simply a messenger telling us that something is not right. Mm. So yeah. instead of instead of resolving the issue, what we do is we try to mask it or we hide it or we try to scrape it away. You know, everything that you're sharing just makes me think, uh, goodness, like all our ancestors, how many of them were probably running away from like lions and tigers in the past? Yeah. Uh, you know, because that's what we've kind of inherited, that fight kind flight. of flight and fight. Mm. Uh, it just, it is a bit of a wonder. Um, oh, we don't have to go that far back, uh, Shan, that, sorry. If we if we just go back to, for example, partition, yeah. okay? Yes. That people were running across borders uh, in fear of their life. Uh -huh. If your if you're nanny, if your nanny, your mum's mum, was running across the border, okay, or had to make that uh, transit from, you know, uh, the Indian subcontinent into the UK or America, wherever, in her ovaries was your mum. And in, in that ovary was you. Yeah. So even okay. though your nanny was making the transfer, you are still being affected by that energy. Because there might have been famine, there might have been starvation, everything, you absorb that energy. And it almost get absor gets absorbed into the genetic coding as well. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Because this is fascinating. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, so, so basically, what I want to ask you from everything that you're saying, um, there's, it seems like there's like a spectrum of um, mm. stresses. Uh, that you, you know, especially when you're trying to figure it out in your own body. But there are things that are a little bit more benign that we, we actually do, that we were talking about earlier on, things like procrastination. Now, apparently that uh, that stems from anxiety as well, that often many of us are just doing it unconsciously. Like, what's the connection wow. between procrastination and anxiety in your understanding? Procrastination, the emotional root cause of procrastination, comes from the sense of uh, feeling unworthy. Wow. So as a child, as you were growing up, um, as you as you were growing up as a child, um, <clears throat> whenever you try to um, whenever you try to show you know that you've done a piece of work or it wasn't uh, acknowledged, it wasn't appreciated, um, it was put down, then you ultimately start thinking, what's the point? And when you get into that phase, then then you think, okay, I'm going to start a new project. You start doing it, but then what's the point? I'll do it later because even if I finish it, I'm not going to get that recognition. So there's a void from your childhood that actually needs to be fulfilled within yourself before you can start to overcome that that whole uh, root cause of procrastination. Goodness, I think uh, that will hit with a lot of viewers who, uh, you know, when you mentioned the masking of anxiety, and that's obviously one of those, and. You know, so many people wouldn't even realise they're doing it. Um, coming back to uh, some practical solutions, I suppose, for our viewers. When you think of anxiety, uh, one would assume that it's just before an upcoming event or fear, um, which tends to happen either the next day or over the few coming days. And it tends to be at night that it really hits you. And you just, you know, that reference of, I just can't turn off my mind at night. You know. Is there anything that you can suggest that someone can do to try and help themselves overcome that? Yeah, so for example, my kids are going through this now, okay, because school starts in a few days. So they're already losing today's happiness because of an event that is going to happen regardless. So communication is extremely important, trying to understand the whole sort of, um, you know, step-by-step -step process that we have to go through. So in, in this case, it was like, you will go to school. The day is coming. Thursday is coming or next Monday is coming and you will go to school. But today you're not at school. Today you can be happy. Let's utilize this opportunity now to actually just enjoy ourselves. 
Okay, because when it does come, we'll take you to school and we'll have a good day as well. But what we tend to do is, like I said, anxiety is the fear of the unknown or fear of a future event that you cannot control. So when you start worrying about something in the future, you have detached yourself away from the present. And one of the most important things that Islam teaches us, okay, and this whole concept of salah, why does Allah call us five times a day to stand in his presence? And not just stand, not just attend, but to stand there with khushu, i.e. stand there with presence. Is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala requires us through our salah to become present within ourselves. Because only in the present moment do we actually fully benefit and connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The moment that we start to think about the future or the past, and again Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, Verily, the friends of Allah are those who have no hope, i.e. hope, the fear, which is connected to future, and they have no grief, which is connected to the past. And this is so beautiful, you know, from for me as a therapist looking at holistic healing, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, if you want to become my friend, be in the present moment. Okay, stop worrying about what's going to happen in the future because I've got that controlled. Stop worrying about the past because what's happened has happened. And so as you remain in the present moment, and like what your question was, how can we switch off? Simply just start winding down easily an hour or two before bed. Okay, and journaling is actually a good thing. You know, make a list of things what potentially could go wrong. Okay, what's the worst thing that could possibly happen? And then see, has it ever happened to me in my life? Okay, I go to work every Monday, or I've got an exam, I've had exams for my whole life, um, but have I ever died in it? Have I ever, you know, starved because of not passing my exam? And so ultimately what you realize is the, the uh, illusion that the nafs creates of, you know, the worst case scenario is just amplified, unfortunately. Mm. And so you have to sort of break it down piece by piece and say, okay, you know what, I'm actually safe. Allah is my Rabb, Allah looks after me, and I'm going to get through this as well. And if I don't get through, I'll try again, and then I'll get through. So it's all there. But again, it's a matter of slowing down. Yeah. Yeah, I think you know, those are really good practical steps of letting go uh, the anxiety that tends to bring us back to the present moment. Um, yeah. One final question. Uh, it's a bit of a deep mm-hmm. one. Um, it's, it's, it's based on you know many of us and our Islamic uh, journeys, spiritual journeys in life. You know, we're, we're all told to be fearful of Allah, fearful of the afterlife. How, how do you, uh, and that can often also bring about anxiety. Um, yeah. you know, fear, stroke, forward um, anxiety. Like, you know, mm-hmm. what, what, how do you balance that out in terms of our personal journeys? Like, where, where should the line be where, you know, you're, you're feeling that comfort and ease, but it's a manageable yeah. fear and it's not quite swerving into anxiety? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think um, that's such an important point that I have a lot of clients that I see who come to me and say, I've got fear of death and I've got fear of, you know, I've done so much wrong in my life, Allah's going to punish me, etc., etc. So they don't want to look at that side. But where did this actually come from? It's the way that we were nurtured in madrasa or the teachings. Yeah. Don't do this, Allah will punish you. Don't do this, the snake will haram, bite you. Haram, haram, haram. Everything is haram, right? So... Islam is not like that. And my, my response to that is that Allah is not petty. Okay? Allah is not going to nitpick and say, look what you did here, look what you did here, did you did it. That's not, that's not, our, this is not my Rabb. My Allah is loving. My Allah is forgiving. My Allah is merciful. My Allah is looking for an excuse to forgive me and you. Allah is looking for anything. You simply have to pick up a stick off the road and move it to the side. And that could be the cause by which you go to Jannah. Okay, just the other day we went out to eat. My daughter saw a piece of, um, you know, foam or something stuck on the bike route. She picked it up, moved it to the side. I said, mashallah, look who's going to Jannah. <laughs> and it, it's encouraging them. It's encouraging them. And, and so, look, don't feel like Allah is looking to punish you. Rather, <clears throat> look at all the excuses that Allah has created in our lives by which he is seeking to forgive us. And Allah, you know, this, this is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah, you know, his, his mercy and compasses over his wrath. So the wrath is there, but it keeps us in balance. When we worship Allah, it shouldn't be out of fear, but rather out of love for the care and the compassion that he has for us. And so once we begin to understand that relationship, and once we change our perspective, then we say, okay, alhamdulillah, 
we have to recognize the fact as human beings, Allah created us, uh, created us as insan. So we will naturally uh, be faulty, we will be uh, unjust, we will we'll fall into every other category of, of you know, sin, unfortunately. But then Allah says, but just ask for forgiveness. Okay, every time you, you do something wrong, just ask for forgiveness. Why? Because in the Allah, Allah loves the people who ask for forgiveness and those that purify themselves. So life is a journey. We make mistakes, we ask for forgiveness, and then we try again. We make the same mistakes. Allah in the Prophet reminded us, even if you make the same mistakes 70 times, ask forgiveness because if Allah said, if my if the Ummah stopped asking for forgiveness, I would destroy all of you. Okay? and create another ummah that would make mistakes and ask for forgiveness, and then I will continue forgiving. So when we have all this evidence of Allah's mercy, then why do we focus on a few that talk about the punishment? All right, so Heb, that, that was a really powerful note to end on. Thank you so much for coming on to the show, Inshallah. We will get you back on. Uh, thank you for explaining. Inshallah. And to us. Good to see you. To see you again soon. Breathe deeply, please. We will. Yeah, breathe deeply. <laughs> We will. Thank you so Thank much. You. Now, we are Bye going you. for a short commercial break. Don't go anywhere. We'll see you back here soon.